on stage are Associate Professor Ong Biao Chi, Mr. Bernard Menon, Ms. May Tan, Mr. Wong Heng Fang. Mr. Stephen Forshaw is the moderator for Community Responses to COVID-19. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for joining us again for this, the second panel in this afternoon's Tomasic Shophouse Conversation. Uh, my name's Stephen Forshaw. I'm very pleased to be your moderator for this afternoon. And I'm very, very delighted to introduce four distinguished panelists with me this afternoon. Uh, starting at my far right, uh, Associate Professor Ong Biao Chi, uh, Chairman of the Medical Board of Sengkang General Hospital, Singapore's newest public hospital, uh, uh, Professor Ong contributed significantly to the development of the hospital, but also to the hospital's program for uh, its COVID-19 patients. So she'll have some great stories to share with us this afternoon. Uh, Bernard Menon, the Executive Director of the Migrant, Re uh, Micro pardon me, the Migrant Workers Centre here in Singapore. Uh, itself a joint initiative of the NTUC and the Singapore uh, National Employers Federation. Uh, he also serves as a director of uh, NTUC's Migrant Worker segment. Bernard, thank you for joining us. Uh, May Tan. May is the co-founder of Kampong Kakis, a ground-up movement that matches needy families with volunteers in their local neighbourhoods. Uh, and she established uh, uh, Kampong Kakis after herself recovering from COVID-19 in early 2020 and noticing the need for such a service. So May will give us some very personal insights as well during her session this afternoon. Welcome, May. And uh, on my immediate right, uh, Mr. Wong Hyang Fine, the Group CEO and Executive Director of Sabana Jurong, one of Asia's largest urban infrastructure and management services consulting firms, 16,500 staff across 40 countries, himself a distinguished engineer and graduate of, uh, of um, NTU and now an adjunct professor at NTU in their School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Uh, Hank Fine, thank you also for joining. I think three things came out of the last panel that are worth picking up in this panel. Um, Sean opened by saying that viruses don't respect borders. They don't respect ethnicity. They don't respect language. At the end of the day, they transmit very easily and very widely across communities. Professor Tan said that science has become very international. The sharing of experiences from scientists across the world has put us in a much better place than we've ever been in previous pandemics, particularly of this size and scale. But I think it was Dr. Jamila whose point brought it home to me in how we frame this panel. Solutions must come from communities. Where we do well, it often arises because the communities themselves, uh, because of the communities themselves and how they acted. And I think let's pick that point up. And if I can start first with Professor Ong. Professor, what were the key points or the key things that you look back on in our community's response? And, and particularly in the healthcare setting where you are, that we would do well to learn from going forward. Okay, so maybe I bring you back to SARS. Um, basically, I'm a SARS survivor. And at that time, I was a young doctor. But I worked with a colleague and friend who, um, who died uh, during that period, um, like three weeks uh, after we have worked together. So I think that was really a painful experience. And when this 
I think all of us hope that um, SARS would be the last that we have of a pandemic. So I think when it first started, um, many of us really had a heart sinking feeling, especially when uh, SARS gave us the experience that um, there was a lot of fear about healthcare workers and, and our families as well. Right? So, you know, we looked back and then I asked myself, what did we not do well during SARS that we should do better this time? Right? And I think we really have learned from it. And I must say, credit to the whole system, um, two things that we really learned from the SARS experience. One was that we didn't get information fast enough during the SARS period, right? By the time we knew it was like, you know, that there was too much uh, down, down, uh, down water, right? So what that went well this time was the communication, transparency of information. I think even if you look today at uh, gov.sg, you, you get almost instantaneous information. I think that is very, very laudable, right? Now, the other thing that I think we have done really well from that experience, which I think much of the world maybe that has not experienced SARS didn't have this opportunity. And that's the fact that we have um, no shortage of supplies. I think at no point in time did I feel that I'm compromising my safety or my staff's safety because we were short of something or other. And at no point in time did we feel that we were compromising patient care because we didn't have uh, an, a piece of equipment that was necessary. Right? Um, in fact, I had a UK resident who was with me, one of our doctors, who helped manage the first patient that we had. And um, he went home, right? And two months later, he texted and said, you know, I'm now COVID positive because I manage a COVID ward in, in UK. And he said, I now appreciate why you were so anal and so strict about your SOPs, right? And I said, look, here's the whole SOP. Please take it and use it. Yeah. Copy, share, right? But I think quite quickly, we realized that um, maybe if you bring out the first uh, picture for... First slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so this was, uh, you know, we had no difficulty getting everybody on board, even though it's Chinese New Year, coming up to one year. And I have to say, quite um, embarrassed myself that despite this, this was when the hospital was being built, 2017, 2016. We had 5,000 workers on site. Right? But I never asked the question, where did they live? So much so that when we saw this, okay, initially it was, we learned that uh, unlike SARS, COVID is a community thing. SARS was very much a hospital disease, right? But this was a community disease. So initially, when we first saw patients from the community coming in, it was something like, of 50 swaps, I get maybe one or two positive. And then, they alerted me and said, hey, there is this group of patients coming from somewhere where if you get five, it will be three positive. And over two or three days, instead of like five, we had 15, then 50. And one day, because of uh, language and uh, issues, it took us a while to realize, once I asked uh, one of them, where are you from? He couldn't quite say. So I said, how did you come here? And this guy who was COVID positive, 38 degree temperature, said, I walked here. This was when I told my team, hey, look, folks, we are at the bottom of this river, right? And we are picking people out, you know, like this. They, they, over a few days, it went from like 5 to 50. We are just picking people out like this. It's not going to make it, right? We should go and find out whether there's something upstream. Maybe there's a waterfall. Maybe we need to build a fence around that waterfall so that nobody else drops in and we don't have to be picking people out from, from the bottom of the river. So when, I must say, even for myself, when I went to the dorm, it was an eye-opener to see 12,000 people there. Now, what did we do well? What we did well was, you know, all the ministries stepping up. When we went there, um, there was MOM, SPF, SAF, everybody was there. But at the same time, I found that it's difficult because we are all disparate. Um, all of us are trying to do our best in an area that we are no experts. How do you then coordinate information and movement so that we are fast enough? So for example, when we noted, hey, it's all coming from this block or it's all coming from this construction site. How can we do it faster so that we can cordon this off? I think Chua mentioned this as well, right? If we can cordon it off, it may have been a much better situation. 
right? And in, in that aspect, um, I think in the end, it's about trust. When we realize that there's a group of people who will stay here, and it's not like every two weeks I'm on roster, and you stay here and we trust each other, we can openly discuss, hey, this is the problem. You know, if I want to do it like this, uh, this is your problem and you can't do it, okay? How do we discuss what needs to be done from the medical perspective as opposed to the dorm operation, as opposed to um, top-down uh, orders as well. How to make that balance so that we can let the ground staff have some uh, say and get that information together, as well as let the um, whole nation and the whole uh, uh, government, in a sense, have consistency and uniformity. Right? In the end, I think it's all about trust. And um, I will uh, just say that Everybody contributes, right? This is one of the workers who came excitedly and showed me his two-day-old baby. And um, just very privileged to share these moments with them, right, when they build trust. And I think everybody contributed. The guys in yellow are actually uh, dorm residents. They sort of said, hey, rather than sit here and do nothing, what do you need? Let us help. So, and then um, all the people behind are the ministry people, our, the volunteers quite a few VWOs, right? Everybody coming out together. This was National Day. Bernard, you represent the Migrant Workers Centre and a large number of people that you work very closely with were very involved in this outbreak. Leading the community response to help those in this situation, talk us through what you saw and, and how you mobilised the community around uh, looking after the welfare of the people who you are most charged to look after. So, um, thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Tomasek, for having me today. Um, I, I think our involvement in this current crisis began in all the way as far as early January. Uh, we were starting to see in other countries uh, that COVID-19 was starting to take hold. And um, we knew while we would hope for the best, we knew we had to prepare for, for the worst. One of the things about my, the migrant worker community in Singapore is, you know, back when Singapore as a country learned its SARS lessons um, and all those crises after that, I think at that time, uh, the migrant worker community had not grown to the size that uh, it is today. Um, so much of the migrant worker community were, weren't here when we learned those lessons. Uh, so our immediate uh, concern was, you know, how would we try to bring them up to speed in terms of knowledge? Um, we ourselves, we had trust in our public institutions, uh, our systems and our structures. And we knew that uh, Singaporeans, you know, when faced with a crisis, tend to gel together pretty well. But migrant workers make up a quarter of our population, a third of our workforce. Um, and, you know, looking at how COVID was starting to develop, if it were to take hold in a migrant worker dormitory, for example, uh, then we could have in our hands the uh, beginnings of a major crisis. So even before the first case visited our shores, we began to go out and uh, engage a lot of migrant workers, uh, different communities at work sites, uh, workplaces, at dormitories, um, sometimes thousands at a time, speaking to them about, you know, what we knew for sure at that time, how you can protect yourself, what precautions you can take, uh, you know, washing your hands, uh, keeping yourself safe, uh, two meter distance was what we were uh, trying to disseminate at that time. Uh, and then quite inevitably, uh, a migrant worker cluster uh, was formed. And, um, you know, in peacetime, we are a migrant employment NGO. Uh, so, you know, our bread and butter is basically representing migrant workers with employment disputes. Um, and there's no real organization or body or people or uh, individuals um, that basically have as their main occupation uh, helping migrant workers, you know, through a, a crisis like this. Um, so I think for us, it was more or less you know, they're empty shoes, no one to step in these shoes. You know, what, what can we do? And uh, we pivoted 
much like a lot of businesses, we pivoted very quickly too. Uh, so our, our chief concerns began to become things like, how do we get enough masks in uh, for all the migrant workers in all the dormitories? Uh, what do we do about food um, and all these things? And uh, yes, we, we did trust our, our public institutions that you know the Ministry of Manpower, uh, Home Affairs, the armed forces would be brought in, that they'd look after the basic requirements. But there would be additional things that would need to be uh, done uh, in these migrant worker communities to assure them, to ensure that uh, care is there, uh, that they will not be left behind, uh, and to continue to engage them throughout this process, especially when the dormitories came under lockdown. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I'm very grateful that uh, the Migrant Worker Centre ourselves, in, you know, in, in, in doing our uh, normal uh, advocacy for migrant workers, uh, we very early realised that, you know, no one uh, can do anything alone. And so, our chief strategy would be to work as an aggregator, a partner with stakeholders, partner with corporates, uh, and also a form very tight relationship with our clients, so the migrant workers themselves. So we quickly immersed ourselves in migrant worker communities prior to COVID, um, and also worked with a lot of partners. And all this came back to revisit us uh, when the dormitories uh, uh, you know, got involved in this crisis. Mm. So all the supplies, uh, we worked with corporates to acquire masks. Uh, we worked with the Masik Foundation, in fact. Uh, sanitizers, uh, all which we would then supply to the dormitories and the workers that were there. Numbers roughly about 400,000. Uh, on top of that, uh, we, we had actually formed an ambassador network of migrant workers themselves, all living in the dormitories. And uh, you know, we never knew how valuable they would become until the dormitories came under lockdown. And I'm sure all of you would have read in the news, every time you know, somebody refers to ambassadors at the dormitories, helping with the distribution of food, helping to ground sense, to see where the problems are, who was infected and things like that, working with the FAST teams on the ground. Those ambassadors they refer to are MWC ambassadors, 5,000 of them that continue to serve us even now. Um, so I, in conclusion, I, I think uh, I'm a lot like Prof Ong. Uh, I think in some areas in our response to COVID-19, lessons from SARS maybe are invalid in terms of helping us. But uh, the one thing we always have is our trust and our unity, our faith in our public institutions, the fact that our NGOs and our people uh, in times of crisis have this amazing ability to um, overlook where we disagree and stand together. Um, and I think that struck me uh, through the whole experience as the one lesson, the one, if I may use a bit of a cliche, secret weapon that we have, um, that right. perhaps maybe it's not so easy to, to uh, get and perhaps other people may not have uh, something as strong as ours. Great, thanks, uh, thanks Bernard. Ladies and gentlemen who are watching us online, we are open for questions as well, so please use the, uh, the, the facilities to ask your questions. I'll see them and we'll have some further discussions with the panel with your questions as soon as they start coming in. Let me turn now to May. May, you have a very personal and very community-oriented perspective on this. How did you see it? And some of the points that you've just heard, for example, Bernard make about the importance of community coming together. You're right at the pointy end of that. Talk us through what it's meant for you and, and what you've observed in the community doing what you've been doing since, since COVID started. Sure. Uh, so I actually have some slides um, I can flash that. Yeah, so as uh, Steve mentioned, I was actually case number 827. And after recovering from the hospital, I wanted to do something for the community, especially the marginalized groups. And that's where two of my friends and I came together to start Kampong Kakis. And as Steven mentioned, it's a neighborhood buddy system. So why is this buddy system important? And why you know, is this important for a future pandemic as well? Uh, firstly, uh, when the circuit breaker started, or lockdown for international friends who, who don't know the term circuit breaker, 
um, a lot of the stay alone seniors, they were at the tail end of quite a broken telephone line. Prof Ong, you mentioned we did do a very good job with disseminating information through gov.sg, a lot of our digital channels. Uh, but these seniors who used to get their information from hanging around coffee shops, you know, hanging around um, senior activity centers, they were not receiving updates on new measures uh, and, and, and new regulations. Um, so with this buddy system, we're actually making sure that someone who is more savvy, who is able to receive news from online channels, is able to convey that to our seniors. Um, I think in the previous panel, they mentioned that education is really important to make sure the community responds well to COVID-19 or a future pandemic. And uh, a lot of these seniors were not being educated. So our Kampong Kakis are actually, the volunteers are actually uh, very much like our educators to our seniors as well. Um, so just some pictures, these were taken more recently of our volunteers and the seniors. Uh, the second thing why this neighborhood buddy system was so important is that it allowed um, the individuals in the community to build that kind of trust. Uh, and, and as you know, both Prof Ong and Bernard mentioned, trust and unity is really important in this time. Um, we wish this was started earlier because then our seniors would have someone that they could easily call upon in times of a pandemic to say, hey, you know, what's going on? Um, and very often, uh, you know, in a pandemic like this, and we've seen in news, right, uh, mental health issues tend to escalate. Uh, I think the news reported that SOS hotline calls increased 30 to 35%. Uh, family violence cases, I think, increased um, about 22% during the April to May period. Um, so our Kampong Kakis are very much like the eyes and ears uh, of our marginalized groups on the ground as well, and they're able to detect signs of distress uh, early on. And you know, our government has done the phenomenal jobs and you know, all the community groups together as well in meeting the basic needs, like um, providing you know, food, meals, um, masks, you know, sanitizing packages, financial assistance uh, especially. But uh, I feel like the mental health and psychological needs were not as well met. And I'm pretty sure, you know, for the next pandemic, if we can come together to put in place frameworks that will also um, meet those needs, then we are providing a more holistic, uh, um, you know, solution to meeting the community needs on the ground. Okay. Um, and I think to my last point, it would be that actually, um, you know, we've mentioned that this is a disease for the community to fight. And what we've realized, you know, through Kampong Kakis is that by empowering the individuals of our community, they can really step up and really play, play a part and make a big difference uh, in how we solve uh, the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19. So what we did is we actually uh, put together a resource kit for all our volunteers. Uh, you know, we put down the financial schemes, we partnered with over 20 community groups to the point of unity again uh, to put together resources that were very key and relevant during this period. And armed um, with this uh, resource kit, our volunteers were able to guide and help, you know, um, families struggling with financial difficulties or seniors facing some problems uh, to improve their situation um, during the time of the pandemic. And I think more and more now, our volunteers are also becoming like an extra pair of eyes, ears, and very helpful hands to our social workers uh, because they tend to be on the ground, whereas our social workers can then take a step back and look at policies, right? Um, and we find that we are actually building a more resilient community in that way because we are now a bridge for the general public and these marginalized groups and uh, making you know, us more resilient for our future pandemic. Attach with yeah. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, May. Yang Fine, you represent an organisation that's used to designing cities and working for years to build infrastructure, but in a matter of days, you came together as a team and built a remarkable community care facility. What was the key learning for you in in applying your own efforts uh, as a leader, uh, but also in what you did to to help the community? Well, uh, thank you, Stephen. I think uh, looking back, when we were first tasked to uh, you know, look all over Singapore at all the facilities and repurpose them into healthcare facilities, I think uh, uh, one thing you know, that struck us uh, you know, very deeply 
was that every facilities that we look at uh, were very single purpose uh, uh, building. Uh, and to repurpose them into something else was extremely difficult. So we took that as a lesson, and I think you know, the things that we came back with was that in future, you know, when we do facilities, you know, whether it's urban or infrastructure, we better look at how we can repurpose them into some other use yeah, uh, going forward. So just let me, maybe you can bring up the slide. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, we did the, uh, the expo, uh, and I, I will tell you a little bit about some secret yeah, that a lot of people doesn't know. Uh, you know, we went to the National Stadium, yeah, and we fit out with uh, Pantages, yeah. So, I, you know, uh, DPM talk about agility, collaboration, yeah. Uh, I would say that today, every of the facilities that we have done, without the collaboration among the local partners, as well as overseas, uh, we wouldn't have been able to complete it, yeah. And one of the key things that was really severely missing in all the facilities that we've seen was common toilets, yeah. So this is an example where we design a portable toilet that we can, you know what we call it, plug and use, yeah. Uh, so we, today we have about, we have done about 300 of them, yeah, and deploy them across the island so that we can refit all these facilities and, you know, of course, offer safe, yeah, and secure uh, facilities for, for the people. The secret about the thing is that, you know, the speed that we do. Yeah. Uh, I remember on the 29th of March, uh, on a Sunday, Dilan gave me a call yeah, and said, hey, you know, why don't you go down to Expo and, and take a look? Yeah. So we went down uh, and uh, we got the green light to go ahead on the 3rd. Without knowing that in the afternoon, PM declared circuit breaker yeah, on the 7th. So we had literally a few days to draw up all our plans, appoint the contractors, yeah, and move in the workers. Yeah. Uh, and the first two halls uh, was operational really on the 7th. Yeah. Uh, but we didn't, didn't have, to, uh, we couldn't admit the, the patients because we got to pass the NCID uh, approval. Yeah. So it took us a couple of days. Uh, and on the 10th, we received our first patient at 8 p.m. A lot of people didn't know that we finished that hall only at 6.30. Yeah, because yeah, during this uh, circuit breaker, we literally ran out of things. This was the first time when we do project that even with money, we couldn't execute it. Yeah. So with the help of Boon Hyung, we got in touch with the Indonesian embassy, who then called us manufacturers in Indonesia yeah, to turn out our baits and so on. Uh, we call up uh, Ken Ping from NTUC to open up his warehouse so that he could uh, uh, get us you know, the plastic containers because we ran out of all the cabinets. You know, there was no cabinets uh, in Singapore. So we got to improvise you know, you know, drilling the holes uh, in the cabinets because we also have to consider the safety of the workers. Yeah. If any one of them have a fight over lost items, we will be in deep trouble. Yeah, so we had to go and drill holes in the cabinet and put padlocks. Yeah. And all this was done during a circuit breaker. Uh, and as you can see, you know, without workers, we can't do anything. Yeah, literally, you know, we had to go and mobilize workers from our contractors yeah, to execute the, the job. So, one of the key things that we like to suggest to a lot of the building owners, uh, whether it's uh, 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 you know, a, uh, 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 um, a hotel or convention centers, is really to think about how can we repurpose yeah, the facility in the event of emergency. Yeah, once you have that, you will be able to quickly mobilize yeah, uh, and, and fill it out. Yeah. So this was a very good lesson sir, to us. Uh, I must say, none of the facilities was designed for that. Yeah. And so, and because of that, and because of the uh, lockdown, uh, we couldn't do quite a lot. Mm. Yeah. So next time a city in a couple of weeks, perhaps? 
Yes. <laughs> oh, Bernard, of course, it changes our way of thinking. Eh? Bernard, how important were the community care facilities for the migrant worker population? So um, I, I actually wanted to make the comment myself uh, because um, you mentioned that uh, they were ready for on the 7th of April. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, if you think about it in, in, in a real world situation, it's incredible that they got that ready. The first dormitory came under lockdown under Gazette on the 16th of March. Mm. So you're talking about getting that facility ready for 8,000 occupants three weeks from when the first dormitory came under a Gazette, which, which happens to be S11, yeah. where Prof Ong was active also. Yeah. Um, so they had 14,000 workers, uh, all living in close commune with each other, which, you know, for the purposes of COVID-19 would be dangerous. And there was an urgent need to be able to start segregating and cohorting workers. So, um, you know, I, I'm absolutely amazed at how, you know, our different uh, communities, whether it's a business community, the people sector, uh, the government agencies, how everybody came together. And, uh, and thankfully, Mr. Wong, you also mentioned uh, Ken Peng from NTUC, so which is, you know, obviously related to the organization I represent. Um, everyone came in and, and played a part, uh, knowing that there was a crisis and it was critical that we act immediately. So, um, yeah, I, I, the community care facilities for the purposes of cohorting uh, as part of the uh, fight against COVID-19 were absolutely critical, Stephen. And, and Prof Ong, how were clinicians responding to the establishment of these new facilities? You're, you're moving from treating people in a clinic or healthcare or hospital environment into this unheard of environment, like a, a massive community care facility. Was it challenging? Um, okay, so in fact, um, I think Bernard brought, uh, brought up this S11. I, at that point in time, even though we were rushing for the CCFs, they were actually not enough for the immediate. And in S11 itself, we ended up isolating 1,000, 1,500 within S11 it, itself, right? That's why when you ask, how did the medical people react to this? Of course, with great discomfort, right? When I spoke to my guys and, and they said, what, you're going to put people together like that? Who's going to take care of them? Is it going to be 24-7? Is it this? Is it that? Okay, the questions won't end. But we said, look, this is the best that we can do at this point in time. And I have to say, the community came in because, like you say, there's, there are no workers to be found. So people actually stepped up themselves and said, look, we can do this. We can get the tent up, right? To make this 1,000 bed isolation facility, we did have to move people, people around. And their belongings had to move somewhere, right? Um, how were we going to do that? People worked 24-7, even on the ground. And they were willing because when we when I said, look, I'm sorry, it's a weekend. I know you haven't had a break. Do you mind working this weekend? Because one day means a lot. There, there's so many people who are going to get infected in just one day. Yeah. And the guys told me, look, don't apologize. It's our community. This is where we live. We will do it. Just tell us what you need and how we're going to do it. Right. So that is really very, very uh, impressive, I think. So what we're talking about here is the community response when it first happened. Let me touch on one of the questions that, that came through from one of our participants online. It seems that transparency, trust, connections underpin many of the early success stories in reaching out and caring for the vulnerable. Uh, but these are not our natural behaviour during a crisis when our first instincts are often to look inwards. Uh, what's the piece of advice that you can give to build and nurture this culture to keep that culture of always looking outward instead of going back inwards. Um, let me maybe start with May, if I may, on this. Um, the, the community aspect of this, how do you keep people focusing on others instead of looking at themselves? Yeah, I think that's really important and a great point. Um, I feel that uh, we have to stop looking at helping others just from a lens of volunteerism or social work. And uh, I think many of our volunteers that have stepped forward, uh, they see themselves more as a, a friend helping, you know, a kind neighbor. 
it's more about building uh, neighborliness, which can be cultivated you know, from school, from um, parents teaching their children uh, to look out for their neighbors. I think for myself, my parents always you know, help to deliver food to one of my stay-alone seniors in my neighborhood. Um, and that's where uh, that kind of thinking and uh, selflessness uh, sort of started bubbling in me. Mm. Yeah. Um, Prof, uh, how do you see, how, how do we inculcate that, that culture of getting people to, to look more beyond themselves during a time of crisis especially? I mean, you, you went through SARS, you have now been through COVID, disease X is the big one. Yeah. How do we try and inculcate that into our culture? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, in fact, I think it underpins this whole conversation. It's about trust. It's about um, being open, right? I mean, it's not that we knew everything. On the ground, sometimes I said, I don't know, right? And then someone else will feel comfortable that if, you, if you're willing to say, I don't know, somebody else will come and say, maybe we could do this, maybe we could do that. And, and encouraging people to come up with ideas openly. So for example, um, how do we create a space for something it wasn't designed? Right. Even in the dorms, we had, thank you for bringing up toilets. Toilets was the biggest nightmare and we had to figure out what to do, right? But it's also creating trust that I'm not here to, to prove that I'm right. I'm not here to um, sell something, but we are here together. That's why I said, in the end, it was a privilege to share their lives. And they were open to share that, you see. So, so I, I think... What May has said is very important. I wish that this uh, ambassador, this, this uh, community with other people, volunteerism, is a continuous thing. It's not during a pandemic or during some crisis. In fact, I think Singaporeans are very generous. When there's a crisis, everybody steps up, right? But underpinning that, how do we always have a communication which inculcates trust, openness, right? Yeah. If I can build on that, that point of trust and openness uh, and, and come to you, Bernard, with this question from Lin Tang, who's asked, can you say how lockdown conditions were like for the migrant workers and how we supported their physical, emotional and mental well-being? And if I can take that a step further by saying, today, where are we? Uh, are we in a better place with that community here in Singapore than we were before COVID? Or are we? Are there lessons still to be learned? Um, I'll answer like this. I, I do think we're in a better place than when we first began. Uh, but I also think there continue to be lessons to be learned. And, um, you know, much like handling any other unprecedented crisis, these lessons will come. Some lessons we have yet to learn and will continue to learn as we go along. But to, uh, you know, answer Lynn's questions, um, I, I think when the decision was taken, certainly I wasn't there, but when the decision was taken that one of the ways to handle the crisis and the, 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 the rise of infections among migrant worker communities would be to uh, go where there were clusters in the dormitories and possibly gazette them as isolation zones. Um, you know, when th this announcement was first made, I myself had some reservations having dealt with migrant worker communities extensively over a period of 20 years. Um, I think my fear was that the, the people that were making the decision need not necessarily know migrant workers, their culture, their behavioral norms, um, religion, uh, aspirations, fears, anxieties, things like that. Um, but the good thing was that, um, you know, when the government agencies came in to the dormitories, they adopted a very willing to learn mentality, you know. I think they came in early on. In many instances, they asked for the MWC, for one of my ops teams to be there with them on the ground. Mm. Not only to bridge the gap in terms of communication in the native language, but also because, you know, we have the experience. So let me know, yeah. you know, can I do something like this? Would it be okay with them if I were to do something like this? Would they take it the wrong way? And um, to also try and learn certain th aspects of the behavior of migrant workers. So, for example, one of the things that many people may not know is that migrant workers 
tend to want to be in close commune with each other. And um, we learned the hard lesson later on when we started isolating them one by one in hotel rooms. That was when the emotional yeah. distress and all came about because yeah. they were in extended isolation by themselves, which to them was your big no-no, you see. And so we had to come in again, consult in many instances. So all over the, 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 the response, uh, whether it's the CCFs, whether it's the dorms in isolation, whether it was the hotels, or even the army barracks that were used in some instances uh, you know, uh, to isolate uh, workers as well. Uh, in many instances, at least I found in my experience, that all the government agencies, all the partners that were tasked with running, setting up and all these, they were very open uh, to advice. Uh, and in most cases, they sought, these, uh, sought advice themselves quite organically. Uh, so I think as far as the, the experience was, um, we all know that being in extended isolation for maybe a period of two months would be uncomfortable for anyone. Yeah. But I think every possible step, precaution, assistance uh, that could be given to the migrant worker communities was ultimately extended. So I think, you know, looking back, I thought uh, knowing that it would be uncomfortable was one thing. But we managed to mitigate all those things uh, as far as possible, as far as our abilities allowed. Yeah. Yang Fine, can I pick up on a point? If you go back a step to what you do as your day job, you, you and your colleagues are thinking long-term about the planning of cities. You talked earlier about when we're building buildings, we should think about how they can be repurposed for emergency facilities. Maybe it's a little early yet, but how do you think about some of these mental health challenges that are uh, arising here in terms of the future design of facilities? Well, I think uh, you know, through this period, we literally learned quite a lot. I mean, just to give you an example on the migrant workers, you know, we were told that one of the biggest requirements that we have to set up was a very good Wi-Fi system. <laughs> because they wanted to download yeah, instantly the movies and so on. Yeah. And that was not the top of our priority. Yeah. We were worried about fire safety, you know, uh, you know, whether there will be enough showers uh, for them, yeah. uh, and then you know, where they're going to wash their clothes. Yeah. So we set up temporary laundry facilities, but Wi-Fi was never on top of mind. So we got to scramble yeah, to go and make sure that we fill up in every hall a very superb uh, Wi-Fi system for yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because that was one of the things that kept them uh, you know, really engaged. Yeah. Uh, and some of you would have watched a video that uh, the migrant workers were so happy that they created a dance yeah. in the expo hall. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think some of these things, uh, you know, are really the joy that we take when we look at uh, uh, doing our designs and so on. So I guess going forward, when we look at uh, designing of cities and so on, we really need to understand the culture yeah, uh, and the requirements because certain things to us are important, uh, but uh, others are even more important to, uh, to the community. Yeah, so it's all very well to look at hard infrastructure. Yeah. It's all very well to look at clinical procedures and so on, but culture, psychology, mental health impact are going to be increasingly important. That's probably one, you, yeah. I think what you're saying, all of you are saying is, that's probably one of the big takeouts from COVID-19. So, yeah. On, on uh, that point, I think we cannot underemphasize the power of the people themselves. So despite everything that we do, what I realize is um, among themselves, they actually had a very big social group and at one stage, this guy in, in a dorm had a social group of about 25,000 followers. And that's where we made use of, for example, volunteers. My doctors who spoke the language became a guest. And that's how we disseminated um, information and education. And it's because it's hosted by one of their own people. People believed what was said, right? And that was very, very powerful much more than you know, uh, us coming in and doing education and all that, right? including the building and all that. And, and I guess to some extent, we were very lucky because after a while, the FAST team that was uh, in S11, many of them volunteered to stay on. And they were so engaged and we knew each other so well that it became a, you know, almost like a community. It's like your second home kind of thing. 
There's a couple of questions here, and I'm, I'm going to sort of group them and ask a, a number of you the same question. But Prof, you just touched then on people volunteered. How hard was it to get people to volunteer knowing that they were going into the face of, in some cases, the red zone, into, into dangerous territory? How hard was it to convince people uh, or were they very willing to step forward? Um, I have to say we had no difficulty at all from the medical point of view. I mean, one of the things is, I, I, I mean, the leadership went forward. We said, look, I'm scared, but if I think that it's safe enough for me, yeah. I think a lot of my staff after that sort of said, well, we are all scared, but if it's good enough for my leader, it must be good enough for me. And people just volunteered. There, there was no shortage of vol people who were willing to volunteer, both from the medical front, from the, from the community. And like I said, even the, the, the people who are supposed to be rostered two weekly from the various ministries, doing something that they are not supposed to be doing in, in their daily life, they stayed on. They said, look, we'll stay on. So the interesting point, I, I was watching as you said that, that all of you were nodding. So I'm, I'm surmising that you're all going to say pretty much the same thing. Um, but what you're actually saying to us is that leadership matters, but that people at the, at the right time will step up and do the right thing. How important is it that we inculcate that? How do we inculcate that into our, into our culture going forward? We were in wartime. How do we make sure that we keep that in peacetime? May, you're, you're trying to do just this. With, with the community, how do we inculcate that culture in peacetime? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier about uh, building that spirit of looking out for one another in the community. Um, I would say that uh, we should, I think we should, as a community and you know, with the government, um, Prof mentioned about leadership, so it's very important for, for the government to also give um, you know, the, the frameworks and the rails that allows community groups like us to continue fostering uh, that kind of unity and that kind of trust between uh, the marginalized groups um, and um, those people who are able to provide. I think that's very important. Mm. Yeah. Mm. We've got about five minutes left, so I want to ask all of you uh, one question to conclude, if you maybe take a minute or so. What, in your view, could we have done better? Reflecting on it, and I'm not asking you to critique anyone here, but what, if you could wind the clock back, DPM said earlier, it's a year ago. If you could wind the clock back a year, what would you do differently? Prof? Mm, million dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> I guess what I really felt we could have done better is we could have been faster at aggregating information. Because I think when I look back now and I, I, I uh, speak to the, the people on the ground, the people managing the dorms, they did see early on a, pa a pattern, right? And even from the hospital point of view, we saw a pattern. Eh? All the cases were coming from a certain block, right? But how could we have put that information together fast enough, percolated upwards, sidewards, downwards, and acted fast enough to cordon that? Um, I, I, I'm not even sure I have the solution to this. But if you ask me what I felt we could have done better, because I think when we went in even over one week, you could see the evolution, you could really plot it out on a curve that was going exponentially up and we were behind slightly on the curve. Yep, okay. Uh, Bernard, give, keep it quite fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would actually, I would say I, I would have put more effort and time into building our grassroots network among migrant workers. Uh, they've been invaluable uh, to the entire national response, not only the MWC. And I think um, if we'd have known that we'd be faced with something like COVID-19, we would have grown the network at a much quicker rate uh, to a much larger body of, uh, of volunteers. Um, I just want to add one other point on what you said about um, how do we make sure we inculcate uh, you know, this value of giving and volunteering and, and things like that. I think it's important. It was important with SARS. It's going to be important now. And as we move on uh, to to hopefully finally conclude this battle with COVID-19, it'll be important to tell the stories. Yeah. Uh, because that's how we keep 
this in the in the institutional memory, yeah. so to speak, how everybody came together, and so that for our younger ones, you know, and our kids, yeah. they will always they may not have been through the experience, but they will always have something to fall back on. Yep. Thank you, yeah. Kang Fine. About sixty seconds for you. What what if you could wind the clock back a year? What would you want to see done differently or do differently yourself? I I think uh, going through this, uh, you know, quick decision making, uh, without that. Uh, Fear of uh, making mistakes is very crucial mm. in a crisis. Yeah, uh, you know, just looking back, I mean, we didn't know what the virus is all about. Yeah, uh, so to us, we all been trained to be very mission focused. Yeah, I mean, we we, we set out ourselves, we must achieve this. Yeah, and so we are we are very dedicated in doing that. Yeah, uh, so really, in getting that uh, decision made quickly. I think it's crucial. May, a very personal insight to close it all off. It's been a very challenging year for you. <laughs> what would you have done differently a year ago? Yeah, I would say I would not hesitate to spend more time in the community. I think before COVID, personally, I, I felt that I didn't do enough to really you know, um, build the kind of community around me where I live. Uh, so if I could wind the clock back, I would have started that much earlier so that when COVID happened, I would immediately know where the seniors in my neighbourhood that I could reach out to and help them. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, look, I, I think one thing comes through from this discussion very clearly for me. We heard in the last panel about the importance of science and collaboration. All of that takes time. What we heard here from four people on this panel were time wasn't on our side there were no rule books to follow, so we made it up as we went along. And what you heard today were remarkable success stories. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank this panel for sharing very personal and very deep insights as to their impact on the community from COVID-19. Thank you.